Good to be here this morning. Uh, if you would in your Bibles, you can turn over to uh, 1 Samuel 16. 1 Samuel 16. Hope to be a blessing to you this morning. Uh, I want to teach on uh, David and just some lessons from David's life and uh, things that happened in his life. Uh, before I do, uh, I want to let you all know I, I gave you an update, I think last month or the month before, on the mission. And we'll be sending out, I'll be sending out the prayer letter this week, hopefully. So hopefully by next Sunday you'll have that and it'll have the pictures in it and a little updates. And I, uh, I can't give you, you know, every story this morning, but uh, things are going well. Uh, there's always craziness going on. That's just a normal but uh, things are going well. We had uh, there's one man in there right now. He's uh, 20 years old, and uh, he was raised up in Bainbridge, Ohio, and uh, he was just you know on his own from the time 13, 14 on the streets and into drugs, and um, and he uh, joined the mission program. He he met uh, Brent. He knew Brent from times past, and Brent told me he needs to come join the program. And he got in, and a couple days went by, and uh, I guess he went in on Wednesday night in the Brent's room. There we got Brent. We built him a little single uh, little bedroom there. Uh, he knocked on his door about midnight and said, Brent, was this me? In John chapter 3, when our Jesus told uh, Nic uh, Nicodemus that he had to be born again, he goes, what's that mean? And I guess for about two hours they talked and it was two in the morning and Daniel got saved. And uh, Brent led him to the Lord. Brent went through our program uh, about a year and a half ago, or a little over a year ago now. And uh, Brent led him to the Lord and uh, since then, Daniel has been uh, passing out tracks. He gets all excited. He goes, I get this feeling whenever I put the track. And there's these uh, these places across the street that, you know, they supposedly do witchcraft and different things. And they'll go and put tracks in their windows and tracks out in front of the door. And, uh, he stayed for two hours after when I we went downtown for an hour on Friday to pass out tracks and street preach. He stayed for another hour or two hours with a man from our church. And, uh, he's on fire for the Lord. It's good to see Amen. Uh, it's good to see in this age that happening because I always hear stories about people getting saved in the old days and they'd sell out to the Lord and be on fire for God. And nowadays you lead someone to the Lord and you never see him again. <laughs> so uh, it's good to see that. But, um, <clears throat> anyways, I'll give you some more um, updates maybe uh, tonight. I want to give you a couple things here and I'll be sure to give you the break in between. I like my 10 minute break to use the bathroom and get a drink. Uh, we had a Sunday morning the other day. We had a evangelist and he went right up to church time. And uh, I took my 10 minutes. I was 10 minutes late to church. But anyway, I'll, give you all, I'll get you all out about a quarter till. Uh, lessons here from uh, David. And a lot of you know David's calling in uh, chapter 16. Uh, and you can, uh, am I in the right chapter? Yeah, 16. And uh, you look at verse uh, 17. This is Samuel coming to uh, anoint a king. And he tells uh, Jesse to bring his boys and his sons. And he calls them to the sacrifice. And and in verse number 7, we all know the story, but the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. But the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. And Jesse called a den of dad and made him to pass before Samuel and said, Neither hath the Lord chosen this. And Jesse makes all of his sons pass before the Lord. And verse number 11, Samuel said unto Jesse, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in, and now he was ruddy and with all the beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then, said, then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of the brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from the, that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. And that's the anointing of David. That's the calling of David. That's where God consecrated him to be king. And you notice there that he took a horn of oil to anoint David. A horn would have been about that big, and it would have been more than a vial. If you look at whenever Saul was anointed in 1 Samuel, I believe it was chapter 9, it says that uh, he took a vial of oil and anointed Saul. See, Saul was man's choice to be king. And that anointing, that unction, and the the uh, the long longevity, I guess you could say, of God in uh, Saul's life didn't last as long as what it did in David's life. And there's a lot of people where they get anointed with just a little vial of oil. Uh, they, they Instead of getting the whole horn of oil, the whole anointing, the whole filling of the Holy Spirit, they only get a little bit of vial. And you notice that David was anointed with a horn of oil. And that was God's choice that lasted longer. And I just want to point out a couple of things, and I'll go based off the time. i got more than what time would allow, but I'll just give you a couple of things from David that helped me, and I believe that helped you. Um, you notice that David was anointed. Um, he was called, ordained. He was consecrated to be king at age 14, and then he goes back to tending sheep. 
you think here in this chapter that uh, he would be anointed by Samuel, and Samuel would say, all right, David, let's go over to, the, the, to Saul, to the palace, and we're going to get you hooked up with some clothes, we're going to get you through some seminary, we're going to go through some schooling to be king, and, and uh, you're going to learn how to battle, learn how to fight, we're going to take you out of the, the field, and we're going to put you into uh, the, the throne, and he doesn't do that to David. He says, go back to tending sheep. And you all know this, that tending sheep was just a tedious job. It was a common man's job. There wasn't anything special about it. You didn't need much training to do it. And a lot of times we say, yeah, God, I'd like to be a shining light for you. I'd like, to, I'd like to do something great and wonderful for you. I'd like to be known, or I'd like to be on the throne, or I'd like people to be a good leader. And God says, go back to tending my to sheep. You know, whenever God told Peter, whenever he restored Peter's ministry, Peter had denied him, Peter had left him, uh, Peter had spoken up and said, I'll never leave you. Uh, Peter had a vial of oil. He meant it for that time, meant it for that little while that I'll stay faithful to, but he didn't have the whole, uh, the whole picture in view. And uh, God says, Peter, lovest thou me? Lord, yea, thou knowest I love thee. Feed my lambs. And a few minutes go by, and they're sitting around the fire, and they're all talking and, and telling jokes and telling stories, what they had seen. And uh, he brings it up again. It gets real quiet. And Jesus says, Peter, lovest thou me? And Peter starts looking around, and he says, well, Lord, you know I love you. He says, well, why are you asking me this again? And and uh, Jesus just puts his head down, and the conversation continues. And a few minutes go by, and I want you to think how awkward this would be, but Jesus all of a sudden says, Peter, and they're around the fire there, they're around to eat, and he goes, lovest thou me? I bet you that struck Peter. Hey. See, the Lord had to break Peter. He had to show Peter that he couldn't do it on his own. He had to show Peter that Peter wasn't all that he thought he was. It, had, it took a few years to teach Peter that. He says, Peter, love us. I mean, that third time, I believe Peter's heart broke. He said, Lord, you know I love you. And what God tells us sometimes, he says, go back to tending to sheep. You know, God, laid, he said, I lay down my life for my sheep. He's saying, I don't know what to do. Or I don't know how to get busy. Just tend to God's sheep. Whatever it is, just get busy at helping in the Lord's work, helping each other. And uh, no job is too small. I was talking with a man the other day. He's a young man, and I call him young, even though he's six years older than me. That gives me a six-year cushion. Amen. Before I started feeling aches and pains all around me, and, uh, and he was talking, and he, he was talking about how he just feels like he's not doing enough, and he feels like he's being stagnant. He feels like the church is being stagnant and different things, and he says he feels like we should be winning more souls, and that was what he kept going to was winning more souls. And, and I'm for soul winning. I'm for it in every way. I think you should soul win as much as you can. I believe that a, a sheep is supposed to reproduce on its own. Shepherd doesn't procreate sheep. The sheep procreate sheep. Sheep. But he told me, he said he feels like he's not doing enough. Uh, he, he has a child. He has a little uh, one, one half year old girl, two year old girl, and he has one on the way. And uh, he uh, just uh, been remodeling his home for the past year. And he works a full time job as an electrician. He does electricity around the mission all the time for free. And, uh, and he, uh, he drives a van faithfully. He's been doing that for about seven or eight years uh, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. He picks the kids up in the community, he picks up the elderly, he picks up anyone that wants to come. And, he goes soul winning whenever we start that up in the spring, and he goes out on the street whenever he can, and street preaches and passes out tracks, and he just said he feels like he's not doing enough. See, a lot of times we look and say, well, the job I'm not doing, it isn't important. And I told him, I said, you bringing kids to church on Sunday morning, that's an important job. Amen. That's going to last an eternity. Are you bringing elderly people to church? He said, I said, that's going to last an eternity. Are you going out on the street and holding up a sign or street preacher and passing out tracks, that'll matter an eternity. He said, feed my sheep. David was anointed. He went back to feeding sheep. Notice something else about David. Uh, so no job is too small, but notice in verses 21 through 23, it says, And David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him greatly. And he became his armor bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath favor in my sight. And it came to pass, when the evil spirit was from God was upon Saul, that David took a harp and played his hand. So Saul was refreshed and well, and the evil spirit departed from him. I'm not going to get to the evil spirit today because that's a study in and of itself that God put upon him. And, uh, but you notice that David honored and blessed Saul regardless of Saul's sin, faults, and fall. Saul already had the hand of God taken off of him. He's already messed up. And God's calling is not on Saul's life anymore. Saul had faults. Saul had fallen from the kingdom. He was still on the throne, but God's hand was upon him and Saul sinned. And you notice that David still blessed Saul. He still played before him. He helped him. He took an evil spirit off of him. He, he played music before him. Now, you know God doesn't tell us to pick and choose who he blessed and who he helped. I want to read a few verses. I want to read you five verses. You can write them down if you want. It's Galatians 6, 1 Thessalonians 5, 2 Timothy 2, 
Hebrews 12 and 1 Peter 2. And I'll say this again, but in Galatians 6 it says, let us do good unto, do I know the next two words? All men. Let us do good unto all men. 1 Thessalonians 5 says, be patient toward all men. Be gentle, in 2 Timothy 2, be gentle unto all men. Hebrews 12 says, follow peace with all men. And in uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, it says, honor all men. It doesn't say to pick and choose based on whether or not they come to church on Sundays. To be patient towards just those people. It doesn't say to pick and choose whether or not they dress like you, or they talk like you, or they got the same skin color as you, or they're a Republican. It says be patient toward all men. Believe it or not, Democrats need to be saved too. Democrats need to get in church. If you voted for Hillary, we're glad you're here this morning. We're glad you're making the right decision. But uh, do good unto all men. Follow peace with all men. I mean, following peace with people you like, that's pretty easy to do. It'll, it'll take much patience to be peaceful with somebody you like. But somebody you don't like, that takes some work. you got to work at it. Honor all men, follow peace with all men. And First Peter 2, this includes all uh, froward masters. He, uh, you know, froward masters, that's a boss that you don't like. That's a boss that has it out for you, a boss that you can't stand. He says, honor all men. So David honored and blessed Saul regardless of Saul's uh, sins and faults. Um, something else about uh, David, you notice in chapter uh, 17 and verses 15 through 20 that David leaves his sheep with a keeper. But David went and returned, this is in 17, uh, verse 15, to Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. The Philistine drew near in mourning, presented himself forty days. David, Jesse said unto David, his son, take now thy brethren, and ephah for this parched corn and ten loaves, run to the camp of thy brethren, carry, carry these cheeses unto the captain of their thousand. Look how thy brethren fare, and take their pledge. Now Saul and they and all men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting the Philistines. But look at this. And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper. Drop down to verse 22. He left the carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage. You notice David uh, didn't leave a job undone. He finished the job he started. He said, I'm supposed to go out there and feed these sheep, so I'm going to finish this job. He was responsible. But something else you notice, that's the type of the Holy Ghost. You see, the keeper of the sheep that David left, in, uh, the sheep in his hands, the keeper had to be experienced and care for the sheep as much as David did. In order for David to trust the sheep in his care, the keeper had to have some experience about him. He had to care about the sheep. John 14 and John 16, Jesus Christ said, And I pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. When he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, and he will show you things to come. That's a type of the Holy Spirit there, the keeper of the sheep. It was someone just like David that cared for the sheep. I'm thankful that when Jesus Christ took off from this world, He said, I won't leave you comfortless. I'll leave somebody else that's just like me, that loves you just as much as I love you, that can help you just as much as I can help you, that knows just as much about you as what I know, that through His power, I'll uh, lay down my life for you, and through His power, I'll get back up, I'll leave you the Holy Ghost. Amen? And that's a type of the Holy Ghost. Something I, I, else I wanted to show you was uh, the lapses and the, the mistakes of David's life. And uh, whenever I go through these things, I'm not meaning any disrespect by I'm not meaning any irreverence to David. But God wrote this book here for our learning and our admonition. We're supposed to learn from it. And I'm just thankful that there's not a book called the Book of Aaron. Yeah. And you, and you got to read through Aaron's life. Aaron was born, and this is what Aaron did. I'm thankful that I'm not getting up here and preaching, or you don't get up next Sunday and say, all right, we're going to go through Aaron's life and look at it and learn from his mistakes. Amen. But David had some lapses, and God shared them with us. And I'm going to go through them and um, uh, look at them. And I want to bring out a point about them. Uh, you notice in uh, 1 Samuel 21, we don't want to read all these, but 1 Samuel 21, uh, David's foaming at the mouth and clawing the doors of the gate. He's in the hands of the enemy and David's scared. He, he's, um, he's scared of what they're going to do to him. And he's scared that if they find out that he's a king, that uh, they're going to kill him. It says the spittle ran down from his beard and he scrabbled on the doors of the gate. That means he clawed. On the door of the gate, he pretended to be crazy, be a psycho. That's your king. That's a king. You notice in 1 Samuel 22, he's hiding out in a dark cave in those first few verses with a bunch of indebted, distressed, and discontent people. <coughs> Sounds like he was in a Baptist church. A bunch of people in debt, discontent, and distress. Uh, that's why David, that was David. Those men to go on to be his mighty men. 
That's a king right there. He's hiding out in a cave. He's afraid. He just got done acting crazy, and now he's hiding out. And that's a king and his mighty men. I'll say this in passing, but sometimes the mighty men and the kings who seem courageous, valiant, mighty, know a lot about distress, debt, and discontent, which they learned of when God put them in a dark cave. But those are David's mighty men hiding out there. And then 2 Samuel chapter 11, you have Bathsheba and Uriah. 2 Samuel chapter 11, like I said, we don't have time to read all of them. But David commits adultery, gets a woman pregnant, and murders her husband, who was a noble soldier in his army. That would be just like a soldier today going off into battle and going over there fighting the, fighting the war and, and coming home and finding out that his wife is having a child with another man. And that man is like a politician even you even use. A politician has that man killed in battle. That's David, the man after God's own heart. Now I'm going somewhere with all these things. Uh, David loses a child in 2 Samuel chapter 12. He cries over it. He fasts over it. He weeps over it. And he loses that child. Um, I believe it's in 2 Samuel chapter 14. Amnon rapes his sister Tamar. That's David's son. This is the man of God here we're talking about. His son rapes his sister. And because David doesn't take out judgment on Amnon, like he should have, not only as a father, but as a king. He didn't take out, you don't see anywhere in that second Samuel where God, or where David takes out judgment on Amnon. Because he doesn't do that, his other son Absalom grows bitter towards him. And Absalom says, you're not going to do anything about it, Dad? I'll do something about it. And he kills his brother. You ever wonder when Absalom tries taking the kingdom, which happens next in uh, David's life, his own son tries taking his kingdom from him? You ever wonder if that bitterness grew from Amnon? You ever wonder if there were other things that Absalom saw in David's life and he said, uh, that's not right or that's not right and that bitterness, that bitterness grew and grew and grew and uh, because David didn't uh, do what he was supposed to do, Absalom gets bitter at him, kills his brother and then tries taking the kingdom from David. This is David's life. Children, uh, the Bible says, uh, Father, provoke not your children to wrath. David provoked his child to wrath there. Absalom. Uh, the sixth thing you see is in 2 Samuel 15 through 18 his children try taking the kingdom from him. And in uh, 1 Kings 3, Solomon, his son, is a womanizer, fornicator. You can call it that. I guess you can call his 600 concubines and his 300 wives. You can call all those holy marriages. But David's own son, who takes his kingdom after him, he said he has a sin problem, just like his father had. Uh, he numbered the people in 2 Samuel 24. And because of that, pestilence comes and kills 70,000 people. This is David, the king, the man for God's own heart. In 2 Samuel 21, he tried going to war when he was old. He tried going out to battle and fighting a giant just like he did whenever he was younger, and he realized he couldn't do it. And a young man has to take his place. Uh, uh, Abishai, the son of Zariah, secured him, smote the Philistine, and killed him. Then the men of David swear unto him. That this is the men of David. They say, David, thou shalt no, not go, no more go out with us to battle. Thou shalt not quench the light of Israel. David was told by his men, they said, David, we love you, we honor you, you're our king, but you can't go out anymore like that. You're going to bring a reproach upon Israel. They're going to see you out there fighting and almost dying, and we've got to come save you. They said, you can't do that anymore, David. I'll say this in passing, but he had to watch someone else fight the battle, the same battle that at one point brought him all the glory and fame. Sometimes a saint gets older and is more tempted to quit and give up and loses his zeal for God. Because he feels like he isn't able to do anything for the Lord that he once used to do. You know, God told Peter the same thing. He said, Peter, when thou wast young, thou took thyself, thou girdest thyself. He said, but now when thou art old, he said, another man will gird thee and take thee with us so that I will go. He's saying, Peter, you're going to get old and you're going to get to the point where you can't walk around. You're going to need someone to help you. You're going to need someone to assist you. He says, Peter, I'm going to, I'm going to teach you some things throughout life. Here, notice in 1 Peter, he, said, he addresses the people. He says, Peter, an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ in all his glory. Six years go by, and he says, Peter, a servant of Jesus Christ, greeting brethren to the beloved. He changed his tone from 1 Peter to 2 Peter. He went from being an apostle to being a servant. It took him years to learn that. But the point is, is that we were bringing him up this morning, but uh, you think about all the injuries that you get. I think some people, as you get older, you just, I, think, I assume you just wake up in the morning while you're having your coffee with your spouse or your loved one. You just go over, oh, honey, what's hurting on you today? And you just go through, you say, well, my right back has been hurting. And I was getting out of the shower yesterday and I stepped over and my ankle, I came down my ankle and it started hurting. 
And you say, yeah, we ate those, we ate that Bob Evans yesterday and that chicken. I've been having a feeling. You, you go through all your infirmities. That's what you do as you get older. You enjoy it. I look forward to it. I look forward to going to Bob Evans sitting there and just talking about how, where I'm hurting and how I'm feeling. <laughs> But, uh, you know, God has to slow you down sometimes to show you that it's in His power that you're going to have your being. You're not going to do it on your own, Peter. You're not going to do it on your own, David. I know that you went and fought the battle when you were a young man. You were 16, 17 years old, and all the women fell in love with you. They were all singing songs about you. All the men began to follow you. And when you were in your 20s, you had a great following of people. They were even following you to a cave to live there and hide. They trusted your word that one day you'd be king and rule, and they were going to honor you even in that state. But, David, you're an old man now. And you're not going to do things the way you once did it. I tell men on the program, I tell any young people that I preach to, uh, the Bible says the glory of young men is their strength. I tell them to do everything they can physically for the Lord. Cut the grass, weed eat, garden, uh, mow the lawn, uh, pass out tracks, go soul in, go door to door, uh, lift things, move things, do everything that you can for a preacher. Go to the elderly's home, go to the widow's home, go to the older men's home, work with them, help them. Uh, do whatever you can physically because the day's coming when you're not going to be able to. And I try my best, it says the glory of young men is their strength, but the honor of uh, the older, I believe, it says their gray head, their gray hair. But I tell them, I try and listen to the advice of older people. I try and listen to the advice of men. I listen to them talk. And, and I believe there's a lot of men that say, I wish I could do what I once used to be able to do. I try and preach all that I can with the fervency that God wants me to preach with. I know at times I can be foolish. I know at times I can be brash or, or uh, spew off of, of the mouth that something I don't know anything about. But I try and preach with fervency whenever I preach because God, I believe God wants me to. I know He doesn't have everybody do it. The reason why is because I know older men and older preachers that used to preach that way if they can anymore. And I'm imagining me whenever I'm sitting there and I'm that old and I don't have the vocal cords to do it anymore. I pray to God that there's a young man or a man that's able to get up and preach like that. I believe older preachers like seeing that. I believe older preachers like watching young men go soul in and get on fire for the Lord. I believe it encourages them. But David had to watch someone else go fight the battle for him. And I'll give you this, uh, number 10, uh, he couldn't build the temple. First Chronicles 22, uh, God says, David, I know you want to do this thing for me. I know it's a good work that you want to do, but I'm not going to let you. He says, thou hast shed much blood upon the earth in my sight. You say, Aaron, that he, he means he shed much blood, uh, being uh, he killed all those people in battle. No. There's a little baby that died because of David in the womb. Uriah died because of David. Ammon died because of David. Tamar, uh, Absalom died. 70,000 people died. He said, David, because of your sin, you can't do this. That's a tough thing, ain't it? That's a real thing. I tell people this, and I tell young people especially, you can go out and waste your life if you want to. You can grow up in church, you can grow up in a good home, uh, you can be raised by good parents, good grandparents, a good pastor, and you're more than welcome to go out and ruin your life if you want to. But know this, if you ever want to come back to the Lord, He'll take you back. But there are things that you'll lose in that time that He's not going to give you back. And a lot of it has to do with what's up here. Peace of mind. You'll get things put up there that you, you wish you would have never put up there. Memories that you have that you wish you would have never had. But there's things that God will say, I'm not, I can't let you do that. That has shed much blood. But the point is, I brought all these things up. I know they're negative. I know that they're hard. But I, I do want to be encouraged. Think of David as an older man having gone through all those things. Think of psychologically how hard that'd be. Lord, why, why are you having me rule these people? Of everything I've done, all the times I've messed up, all the, the problems that I have in my own life, I can't keep my own family straight, how in the world can I do anything for you? Think mentally how hard that'd be. Think about spiritually being uh, 70, 80 years old, 90 years old, and having to repent of your sins still, and then having those sins brought back up before you. And you know something about David? He never stayed bitter at his enemies. He never stayed bitter at his family. He never stayed bitter at God. He just went all for the Lord. Ain't that encouraging to know that it doesn't matter how bad you mess up. At least it's not recorded in a book. Now, I don't know. Maybe some of you got something recorded down at the jail valves. Maybe some of you got a record down there. I'm sure some of you got a driving record. Running the light poles and hitting deer and everything else. Backing into stuff. But ain't you glad that God didn't write all your sins down in a book? Ain't you glad that even though uh, you might have had some, some, uh, some uh, big mistakes in your life, mistakes that you say, I can't believe that God would even use me after that, He'll still use you. Just go on for the Lord. Keep going. Uh, don't lose your zeal. David never lost his zeal even in, in his old age. And, and I, I could give you a few more things on that. Uh, Paul said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. Um, and then he, he said that demons have forsaken me, having loved this present world. I don't know how old Demas was. 
I know this, he followed the Apostle Paul. He got to see Paul heal blind people. He got to see Paul raise the dead. He got to see Paul do miracles. And, you know, he said after a few years of doing that, years and years of doing it, years and years of battling the flesh, years and years of failing at times, years and years of seeing heartache, years and years of messing up, years and years of getting right and getting on fire for the Lord, he finally said, uh, Paul, I'm, I'm retiring. I, I got a little boat. I'm heading down south. I'm going to go retire the community home and I can't do this anymore with you, Paul. I'm, my health's not too good. I, I just can't do it anymore with my wife. Uh, I just can't do it. I don't know what the situation was, but Paul said he left me and he loved his present world. I'm thankful that Paul stayed faithful, though. He didn't quit. Let me give you one more thing. It's in 1 Chronicles 22 uh, about David. It was that David prepared abundantly for his death. Some of these things are heavy this morning, I know, but I wanted to give you some things that uh, helped me, it blessed me. And I've had this lesson, I wrote it uh, over a year and a half ago, and I still use it, I still refer back to it. In 1 Chronicle 22, it says, in verse number 5, he says, I will make preparation, I will therefore now make preparation for it. So David prepared abundantly before his death. In uh, 1 uh, Chronicles 29, it says what, what, how much money he gave. It says, Now I have prepared with all my might for the house of my God, the, go the gold for things to be made of gold, the silver for things of silver, and the brass for things of brass, the iron for things of iron, and wood for things of wood. Onyx stones, stones to be set, glistering stones in diverse colors, and all manner of precious stones and marble, stones in abundance. Moreover, because I have set my affection to the house of my God, I have my own proper good of gold and of silver, which I have given to the house of my God, over and above all that I have prepared for the holy house. And he gives how much gold and silver he gave. David gave over $10 million of his own money in silver. And he gave over $90 million of gold. David said, we have all these things from the kingdom and we'll use that to build a temple. He said, but I want to give my own money. The money that I, that I get as a king, that what I'm compensated is I want to get my own money to build this temple. And you notice later on that chapter, it says they sacrificed unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings unto the Lord on the morrow. After that day, even a thousand bullocks, a thousand rams, and a thousand lambs with their drink offerings and sacrifices in abundance for all Israel. You think of 3,000 animal sacrifices. If you keep in mind, David's at the end of his life and he's saying, God, I want to, I want to go out the right way. I want to do things the right way. I, I know I, I messed up. I know that I, you've blessed me many a times. And I know that you've done great mighty things for me. But God, I want to end on the right note. I, I don't want to just fade out. He said, I want to do something big for you. They're at my grandma's 80th birthday. They're doing something big for her. And uh, he said, I want to end this thing the right way. And he says, let's go get 3,000 animals and sacrifice. Can you imagine how much blood that'd be? I know how much guts that'd be, and livers, and kidneys, and muscles, and cutting everything out. You guys how long that'd take? How many people have to be involved with that? Can you imagine all that barbecue? Yeah. Can you imagine all that steak, and ribs, and lamb, and Imagine how that smelled before the Lord. And then he says, we're going to do all their drink offerings. So that means 3,000 drink offerings of wine will be poured out. Great juice. That costs a lot of money. It took a lot of time to, to grow a vineyard. He said, we're going to pour out for each animal their, their drink offerings of wine. And that made it smell better. Made the aroma better. And you imagine all that meat being cooked. And you imagine that there's a festival. It says they fellowship afterwards. All the people together, they're, they're cooking all this food and they're rejoicing, they're praising the Lord. They're giving all these things to the Lord. I looked up uh, how much uh, drink offering that would be. And in the Old Testament, they used a hen, a hen of wine. It comes out to about 1.5 gallons. And I did the math, and for a lamb, you had to use a, a, a fourth of a, of, a, of a hen. For a bullock, or for a, a ram, you had to use a third. And for a bullock, you had to use um, one half of the hen. But I did the math, and I did the multiplication, and it came out to over 1,600 gallons of wine. They got 3,000 animals. They're filleting them. They're barbecuing them. They're sacrificing. They're all praying. They're all getting right with the Lord. Uh, they're all getting ready to prepare the temple to do something great together. And, and they're fellowshipping together. And they give all this stuff to the Lord. And I got to thinking, I wonder if that's one of the secrets to getting old in the Lord. I wonder if that's one of the secrets to being faithful. I wonder if that's one of the secrets that kept David going. David never quit giving to the Lord. He gave all that he had to God. And I want to encourage you today, I don't, I don't pretend that's the one single answer. I know you'll hear preachers say, I believe this is the one thing. If you do this, I believe you'll stay faithful. I don't know if it's the one thing. I know this, though. David did it. 
I don't know what you've done in your past. I don't know what you've done. I don't know what you plan to do in your future. I know this. I know that David went out the right way. He said, Lord, everything that I have at the end of my, my latter years, that I've considered the latter end, he said, God, I want to do more than what I've ever done for you. He didn't digress. He didn't fade out. He said, Lord, I want to do more now than what I've ever done for you. Uh, I was at Fellowship Track League there the other uh, day, a couple weeks ago, and we, we took the men down there, and I took a couple teenagers from the church. We had about uh, 10 people down there, and we're sitting there working. It's our first time being there. So we don't really know how things go, and you know you're kind of timid, you know, moving our stuff around. And they take us over to these tracks, and the tracks they have two things, two separate tracks together, but they're still together by the paper. They've been split, I guess, and you just gotta rip them apart like that. And at first you're kind of timid, you know, you don't know how you're gonna do it. You're doing this, you're doing that. And it takes you a little while. So I'm over here, this young teenager in our church, he's 16, and, and I, we're sitting over here doing it, and uh, we're like a quarter of the way through our, and all of a sudden I see I see this woman. This little, little short woman doing this with a cart. And she's taking it over there. It's full of all the tracks in the boxes. And she takes it over there and gets another cart with the two boxes and brings it back. And I said, man, Jeremiah, we've got to pick this up. <laughs> and we're sitting there working on our tracks. We're doing them. We're putting the rubber bands around. We're putting them in the box. And all of a sudden, I see this. <laughs> and bring another box back. I said, man, hot. You know who it was, don't you? Amen. Yeah, yeah, Lillian and, and Janice, I believe. And they said, I think Ruth goes some, too. And and uh, I, did, we, I, I didn't notice at first, and all of a sudden I said, hey, how's it going? I didn't notice that was even you. And they said, yeah, we've been coming here for years. And I told Jeremiah, I said, we're getting out of work by these ladies. And they did three of them. They did three whole track things in the time that we did one. I'm ashamed to say that. Next time I go there, I'm going to do four. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if the weather's high, if my knees don't hurt, my back don't hurt, and I can make it out there and all that. <laughs> uh, but, you know, just find something for the Lord to do and do it. Now's not the time to quit. Now's not the time to give up. Now's not the time to say, well, maybe we should take it back. Now's the time to get it all done. He's coming back. Just any day now. He'll be coming back, and it'll all be worth it. Everything that you give to the Lord, it'll all be worth it. You won't have any regrets given. Uh, whatever you got to the Lord, whatever time you got money, anything like that, you'll never regret giving it to the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I do love you though. this morning. God, I thank you, Lord, uh, for allowing me, Lord, to be here and be a blessing. God, I pray I was a blessing to the church. I pray, Lord, your Holy Spirit, Lord, reprove and rebuke where needed, and I pray it exhorted where needed. Uh, Lord, I thank you for this church uh, here out in the country, God. I thank you for these people that are faithful. I was uh, driving by, Lord, and seeing that the, the modern church there, Lord, and everybody pulling into it, God, or they're going to play their rock music, Lord, and not going to have any preaching, and uh, they're not going to be challenged, Lord, by the Word of God. And uh, God, I just thank you for these faithful people, Lord, who made it out here during Sunday school, took time out of their day, Lord, to, to come. God, I know there's other things they could have been doing around the house or with the kids or with the family. And God, they made it a point to be here in your house, God. And I pray, Lord, you bless them for that. And Lord, I pray that you bless them more through the preaching hour, Lord, to follow. Uh, pray that the hymns, Lord, to have your touch upon them. God, they'd be pleasing to you and your son. Any special for that our son, God, just help us today. We're not to leave the same way as what we came in, God. We love you. Thank you and praise you. We ask all these things in your son, Jesus Christ's name. And amen.